Hi everyone, my name is Jeremy and I work here on the communications team at the Molecular Foundry uh, and I'm here today for a conversation with Peter Urshus, who is one of our staff scientists who has had a number of really exciting breakthroughs in his research recently. Uh, so can you introduce yourself, Peter? Yeah, thanks. I am a staff scientist within the National Center for Electron Microscopy Facility within the Molecular Foundry and I work on some of the world's most powerful electron microscopes to image the atomic structure of materials. Amazing. So you recently achieved the first complete 3D image of an amorphous solid. What does that mean and why has it been so hard to do in the past? Yeah, amorphous materials are really hard things to study for various reasons. Uh, if atoms are arranged in a crystal, they're arranged in a very specific pattern. So in amorphous materials, you can't assume the same thing. So if you go an angstrom over, if you go a nanometer over, the atoms will be in a completely different arrangement or structure. If the, if the atoms are not arranged in a very specific pattern, then if you try to image all of them at the same time, you just get a mess. So in simple terms, the difference between an amorphous solid and a crystal is just that atoms are, are organized in a crystal in a very ordered, evenly repeating way. Whereas in an amorphous solid, they're more like randomly jumbled. And the randomness of that makes it much harder to get a consistent picture of what it looks like in, in 3D space. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. So understanding that that's a, seems like a really hard problem to get around, what has changed and what did you do to, to make it possible this time? So we're, in, we're utilizing a technique called electron tomography. Tomography has been used in many different fields and we're applying it to this. Uh, it, it's actually one of the most popular uses of it is in uh, CAT scans in uh, hospitals. Yeah. We're using it on the atomic scale though. So the key here is that um, the images that we take are two dimensional in nature, but when you uh, take lots of those images from lots of different viewing directions of the same object, in a computer, you can use tomographic reconstruction to then determine where all the atom positions are uh, in that structure. It's somewhat similar to if you you kind of have a, a tomography in your in your brain right now. So if you close one eye, it's really hard to figure out whether the you know my computer screen is in front or behind something uh, because I don't have any three dimensional vision from that. But if I open my other eye, I get two views and I can tell where something is or try to tell where something is in 3D space. We do that on the scale of taking 70 to 100 images, which is what's required to see where the atoms are. So you use the multiple angles of taking different images to kind of conf to infer a little bit of 3D information between each image. And with 70 to 100 images, you can, you can get a whole 360 view. That's exactly correct. Got it. That's so cool. So what are some of the applications or just abilities that you've now unlocked by being able to understand these new materials, these amorphous solids at this scale? What can we do now or what are you excited about for the future? So um, previously, amorphous materials were, were studied by lots of different people in lots of different ways, but nobody had a direct method in order to see where all these atoms really were. So we want to try to find out what the little motifs are or the little structures inside of these materials. And I'll take one example uh, that we actually looked at is called a metallic glass, which is a new type uh, of material that... Um, has very good properties that it can be light, flexible, and extremely strong. So these kind of materials are being used for turbine blades and uh, airplane wings, but we need to understand what they're made of and how they work. And so we want to be able to tell people um, where all those atoms are. And atoms are the building blocks of materials. If we know where all the atoms are, then we can figure out why it works or how it's how to make it better. Got it. So up until this point, all of these amorphous materials that exist in the world around us, like the glass in our windows or cutting edge materials like metal metallic glasses that you work on, we've known that they work, but not necessarily how they work on an atomic scale. And Very true. So uh, as, another, as another example that is kind of surprising is that every transistor, everything that's running the computer that we're using now, your phone, your, your watch, everything now is built on transistors. And transistors are a sandwich between two, basically a metal, a crystalline semiconductor, and an amorphous material in between. And yeah. people still don't know what the structure of that amorphous material is. We've been using it for years to run our computers and run all these things. 
but there are problems with them called leakage current and they heat up too much. And uh, part of that might be that there are defects or problems that we don't even know exist because we have no idea of the structure. So you're saying that something as ubiquitous as the transistors that are in our computers and smartphones all use amorphous solids in them, but this entire time we haven't had a clear idea of what they actually look like on an atomic scale? That's correct. So what are you expecting to come out of this newfound understanding? From understanding at a basic level, almost always comes new phenomena, new, uh, new uses of materials and new capabilities. So if we can understand them at that basic level, something new is going to come out of it. Okay, that's so cool. So now I want to talk a little bit about this other major finding that you guys recently had, which was a major insight into how crystals, uh, the other kind of class of solid materials, are formed and how they nucleate. Uh, can you explain a little bit about what you found and how it was different from what people used to think happened? Yeah, so crystal growth, if you think about it, it's one of the most important things uh, in, in how we make materials. All materials kind of have to start from maybe uh, dissolved atoms in a liquid, and then you have to grow the crystals from that. So that early, like the early pattern, the, the you know, a couple atoms come together out of this homogenous liquid, it used to be thought that that first pattern was really what dictated the, the shape and structure of the big crystal as it grew, right? Well, at least that that early pattern matched what the final uh, uh, crystal would be. Because that the final crystal is really based on the atom bonding. Ah, okay. So, so, so they would bond something. the same way when there's only a few atoms as when there's a billion atoms, right? So because they want to bond the same way, it doesn't matter whether it's a big crystal or a small crystal. But if you think about that, that's maybe not really correct because the at if two atoms get together, there's only one bond. Whereas in the bulk crystal, they might have four bonds or six bonds or many more bonds. So it's not really a stable structure. So then people started thinking that, well, we, we might have these pre-nucleation clusters that are not like the bulk crystal. Um, but it was always thought that you'd start with this kind of randomized cluster. And at some point, it has to turn into the crystal. And then, it, and then it continues only as the crystal from there. And then you add atoms only as the crystal. But what we found was different was that we did find these kind of randomized nucleation cl clusters that didn't match the bulk crystal, but that they would go back and forth from a crystalline state to a disordered state back and forth as they grew. And then once it got to a certain size, then it stayed only as the crystal never, never returned to the pre-nucleation cluster state. So what, so while looking at this under a microscope, you see that rather than just kind of a one and done continuous irreversible process that crystals go through a few intermediary kind of precursor states, what do those states look like? And like, what might they be useful for? Or what are the implications of this, this new understanding? So we don't actually know what they really look like. The images that we take on the microscope are only two dimensional. And uh, since we were talking earlier about three-dimensional imaging, uh, it would be great to be able to see the three-dimensional structure of these as well. Uh, but that's going to take a lot more work. And uh, we're going to need even faster detectors and even faster, um, even better microscopes for that. If we can figure out what those structures are, it'd be really interesting uh, to see, can we keep them in that, in that state? Maybe if we starve them of atoms, if we only use enough atoms that we, they can't get big enough, then you might be able to leave them in, in this state. And rather than having the crystal, which has very specific bonding angles and facets that it shows, um, you might have a unique arrangement of atoms that you could not make in any other way. Whoa. And so by keeping them in this kind of pre-nucleation state, they may have properties and capabilities and applications that you would uh, never be able to create in any other way. Whoa, that's so cool. So this normally in, in nature as we know it is this kind of super transient, like ephemeral state but you might be able to kind of freeze it in time and, and see a new structure or a new arrangement of atoms that doesn't really exist in like normal life. And that's kind of the whole idea of nanotechnology was that by going to smaller and smaller sizes, you sometimes get vastly improved um, capabilities for that material. So you use less material and get more of the result that you want. But sometimes you get completely new uh, capabilities that you do not have in the bulk large crystals. And so this is a new size regime below the nano crystal, which would be the nano cluster or something like that. That's so cool. Are you expecting, you mentioned that right now you're getting these 2D images of the, you know, of the precursor states as they're forming. Is there any chance you'll be able to apply some of that same 
atomic electron tomography technique that you use to image the amorphous solid into this new kind of realm of precursor crystal states? Is that is that down the line at all? There, there would be a possibility for that. So I've worked on a, another technique where instead of us very carefully ch uh, choosing the, the projections that we want, we can actually look at randomized project projections or images of the object in order to uh, figure out what the 3D structure is. If we could hold these nano clusters in this structure and they don't change very much, but all they do is rotate around and we get different images of them just by rotating, then we should be able to get an idea. Uh, we should be able to solve the 3D structure. I have no idea how to do that right now, but you got to try. So this is all happening too fast for you to like actually, you know, move the stage of the microscope or move the angle at which you're taking a camera, but because it's it's kind of frantically moving and rotating of its own accord, you might just be able to get enough angle images to to reconstruct it that way. Yes, that's fascinating. We just have to get images fast enough <laughs> and then be able to figure out where they came from. <laughs> that's awesome. So I guess you've you've got these two really interesting kind of paradigm changing discoveries under your belt now. How how are you feeling about this field and and just kind of what's coming next? What what are you excited about? I'm really excited. <laughs> There's a lot of things going on in this field right now. Um, and one of the things uh, I'm really excited about is are some of the new detectors that that we have uh, uh, coming up. So that new detector is able to image. Uh, at the, the fastest speeds that any other detector is able to do right now. It images so fast, it produces data so fast, it's like watching 80,000 uh, HD movies streamed into your house at the same time. And so then we have to pick all that back apart. So we're looking at all kinds of ways to get more data, get faster data, and apply um, new image processing techniques like artificial intelligence or machine learning in order so that a human doesn't have to watch all of those HD movies at the same time. We need some way to be able to look through the data, figure out what's useful, what's not, and then actually apply that and, and figure out the atomic structure of these materials at new length scales uh, that we have never had access to before. Wow, that's so cool. Um, Amazing. Well, I am, uh, I'm sure I speak for many people when I say that uh, I'm very excited to see what it will be uh, coming from your research and the foundry more generally in the future. And uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me today. Thanks very much. I enjoyed it.